Jesus Christ. And I tried to speak last Sunday on the Messiah and then Sunday night on the Messiah's kingdom. Today we're going to look at the unusual man called John the Baptist. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist was a very unique individual. Very unique. John chapter 3, we're going to pick up the reading with verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey, which, by the way, to the Jew was a kosher food. Grasshoppers and certain insects were allowed. In case you didn't know that, in case you're interested in a good lunch today. I don't know how many of us would be interested in John the Baptist's lunch. But it says here, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Father, we thank you again this morning for the privilege of being here in this beautiful sanctuary with these precious people today. We ask, Lord, that you will just kind of close us in for the next few moments. Hedge us in with your word and your spirit, Lord, and speak to us and teach us the lessons and truths that you want us to know and have this morning. We thank you for the word, the never-failing word of God. We thank you this morning for the blessed Holy Ghost of God that's able to anoint us and help us and inspire us to preach. Lord, we can't do it alone. We need your blessed help this morning. And for all that you do, we'll bow and give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's look at the man. Get right into the message. I've been excited. You know, Christmas is a difficult time for preachers. It's the same story that's been told for 2,000 years. <laughs> and only a very small segment of the New Testament even deals with it. Only two of the Gospels include the birth of Christ. <laughs> I mean, the actual transpiring of the birth, they admit that he came, but they didn't talk about the manger, they didn't talk about the shepherds. Only two Gospels deal with the birth of Christ, really, in any measure at all. And so we have so little material and so much truth, but yet it's truth that we've heard over and over and over. So you you just have to you'll just have to relish the truth that you already know this morning, is what I'm trying to tell you. I don't know that I'll have anything new after 37 Christmases. <laughs> In full-time ministry, I've preached it from every angle I can think of, Brother Bradford. <laughs> I've tried to look at it from every angle that you could ever look at it. But you know, as old as the old, old story is, 
It's still true. And it's still life changing. So if you've heard it a lot of times, just ask the Lord to make it fresh. Make it fresh to you this morning. Make it fresh to me. But John the Baptist, he's a big player in this scenario. His, uh, his preconception ordination is one of the things that makes him very unique. What do you mean by that? Before he was ever born, God had purposed to, to use this man as a prophet. Same way that Jeremiah, and in Jeremiah 1.5, God says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So God had a plan for Jeremiah before he was ever born, before he was ever conceived. And that's true of John the Baptist because God is the one who initiated John the Baptist's life. Uh, it, it was an amazing thing. Zacharias thought, uh, can't happen. <laughs> it's just, you know, uh, you're Gabriel and you come from the presence of God, but I'm telling you, I'm an old man. My wife is an old woman. He said, how shall I know these things are going, not going to happen? Or how am I going to know it's going to happen? And now the angel didn't say it this way, but I said, hush your mouth. You're not going to be able to talk until John comes along. You know, God has a way of helping. But God had a plan for, uh, for uh, John the Baptist, and he had a, uh, a purpose for his life, and he had his hand on him from the very womb. It says in Luke 1.15, the angel predicted this in Luke 1.15, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall ne neither drink wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Now, Jeremiah, the word, was sanctified in the mother's womb. Now, John the Baptist is going to be filled with the Holy Ghost in the mother's womb. These are synonymous. These are very synonymous terms, and, and they mean the same thing. In other words, God was going to put his spirit within this, this what the world calls a fetus. We call a baby. And God put his spirit in John the Baptist before he ever was named John the Baptist. And uh, this is an amazing part of the story. When God can do anything. With God, nothing is impossible. And when you think about the miracle of Christmas and all that is surrounding the incarnation and the birth of Jesus Christ, there are a lot of miracles. And John the Baptist is one of those miracles. Then we find in Luke chapter 1, verse 41, we find the fulfillment of it. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth which is John's mother, heard the salutation of Mary, which is her cousin, who is the mother of Jesus. The babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. They were both filled when God the Holy Spirit came in, that the voice of Mary, the mother of Jesus. His birth, his conception was miraculous. His birth was miraculous due to the fact of the extended age of the parents. God worked a miracle. Another Abraham and Sarah story. God knows what he's doing. Amen. And uh, he did in this case in, in a real measure. For you see, John the Baptist, the man John the Baptist was a miracle man. He was a man that God had ordained and God had called and God had filled. And then his calling is found in Luke 1, 16 and 17. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. That was what he was supposed to do is awaken Israel. Do you know it had been 400 years since they'd had a prophet preach in Israel? At this time of history, the last living prophet that we have any record of was Malachi. And from Malachi to the birth of Jesus was about 400 years. They hadn't had a prophet on the scene. They hadn't had an open vision. God had just kind of left them in the dark for 400 years. But then out of the blue, suddenly there appears on the scene an angel that says, you're going to have a son and he's going to awaken Israel. Listen to what it says. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God and he shall go before him, who's talking about the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elias, which is Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He was the messenger that was setting the way. He was the herald. He was the town crier, if you please. Get ready, get ready. Jesus is coming. Now, he didn't, he didn't use that name in his preaching, I'm sure. 
because he probably didn't know what the name was going to be. But John the Baptist was a unique man. John the Baptist was God's man. Said, how do you know? Well, while only two of the Gospels speak of the actual birth event of Jesus Christ, all four Gospels speak something about this man. And as you study the Word of God in any situation, in the Gospels, you want to compare all four Gospels, if you possibly can, to get the fullest picture you can. And I like what John, the beloved, said in his apostle. He said in chapter 1 and verse 6, there was a man sent from God. Wow. Wow. There was a man sent from God. And you know, that is the calling and that is the, the, the ordination, that is the criteria and the credentials of every preacher ought to be in the pulpit this morning that God has laid his hand upon you and singularly called you to do the work of God. And I believe he does still yet. But John was one of those that God had laid his hand on. God had sent them a servant. God had sent them a preacher. God had sent them a prophet. And it was the man, John the Baptist. We don't know a lot about him. There's the man. There's the mysterious exile. The Bible only says that John was in the wilderness until the time of his showing to Israel. To my knowledge, there was no academies in the wilderness. There was no elementary schools in the wilderness. And there certainly weren't any Bible colleges or seminaries in the wilderness of Judea. And it makes me begin to think, does it make you begin to think, where did John learn to read? Where did John get a scroll to read? Think of it. He's in the wilderness. He's not in Jerusalem where the uh, libraries are and the repositories of divine truth are stored. He's not there. He's in the wilderness of Judea. He's out here in the woods all by himself. For nearly 30 years of his life, he was in preparation. God was grooming him, friend. I believe God taught him to read. And I believe God taught him the scriptures. I don't have any other explanation. Maybe if you do, you can enlighten me about it. But I believe that there was nothing out there for him to rely on except God. And you know, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> We've got everything to rely on, so we don't rely on God. But John the Baptist was sent into the wilderness for his preparation, much like Moses spent those 40 years on the backside of the desert there as he was unlearning all that he had learned in Egypt and God was preparing him for a great ministry. Well, John the Baptist was much like that. He was out in the wilderness alone, solitary. He had time to think. He had time to pray. He had time to meditate. He had time to listen to God. Friend, that's where we're missing it. We're real busy. But John the Baptist was a man sent from God. Don't you ever forget that. Don't you ever forget that when God wants to do something, he calls a man. That's God's method. He laid it on Moses. He laid it on different ones. God calls men to lead. And the only thing that he had out there in the wilderness was God. He lived a very simple life. He dressed very simply, rugged but simply. His diet was very simple, of course. But John the Baptist, what happened in those years of exile? He learned to rely on God. Therefore, when he stepped on the scene, there was no bribery that the Pharisees or Sadducees had. He never took a salary, never passed an offering plate, to the best of my knowledge, in the scripture, never asked for a donation. He simply came declaring what God had said and what men needed to do. Oh, if we could have a generation of preachers today that would be dead to the world, dead to their money, dead to anything and everything except doing the will of God, declaring the word of God. Friend, this is so very important this morning. John was sent from God. 
And he spent that time alone preparing him to do what he was to do. Let's look at his ministry. Matthew 3, 3, for this is he which was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, the saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his way, his path straight. In other words, you've got some things, your, your life is in disrepair, Israel was in disrepair, the religious world was in a mess, it was full of corruption and, and politics and, and all kinds of things that destroy true spirituality. Amen. You can go ahead and amen once in a while. It won't hurt my feelings. But friend, we're living in a day where the church is so political. And I don't mean that in Washington sense of political. I mean that the, the governing and the running and the operations of the church has become political. Men want to dictate what's going on. People want to run the show. John the Baptist wasn't for sale. <laughs> He couldn't be bribed. He couldn't be shut up. And he made such an impact. The Bible says that all Jerusalem and all Judea went out to hear him. What a preacher. What a dynamic man of God that came, that drew the attention of the leadership as well as the commoners. And here he is. He says, prepare the way of the Lord. The Messiah you've been waiting on is about to appear. The one that we've longed for, the one that we've waited for, the one that was promised to our forefathers is about to step on the scene. You need to get ready and prepare the way for him. Wow. What a man, what a man. He was to awaken a backslidden preacher. He was to look different. He was to sound different. He wasn't like the scholarly works that they was used to maybe in Jerusalem. They didn't, he probably didn't say, God like the, the learneds do, but he was able to get the message across from God. Very important. He was bold against sin and hypocrisy. He was bold. And I tell you, it took a boldness in that day because, listen, we know from the life of Jesus that the Pharisees carried some, some civil authority with them as well as church authority. And political authority, they could influence the Romans if they needed to, as they did with the death of Jesus. So John the Baptist was certainly taking his stand when he said, O generation of vipers, called him a bunch of snakes. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John the Baptist was a man sent from God. You said, preachers don't say stuff like that. Well, you'll have to take that up with God. <laughs> I believe John the Baptist was preaching God's message. Amen. And I believe in times where the church is backslidden, it takes strong medicine. Amen. I believe when people have set their affections on other things and have their own agendas and want to run the church according to those agendas, friend, I believe it's time for some strong, strong medicine. John the Baptist was fearless. He just looked at him. He said, if you want to be baptized in my service, you bring forth some evidence that you've really repented of your sins. Wow. What would happen in churches across America if the preachers in the pulpits this morning would tell their congregation, you better quit your sinning and repent, and you better bring evidence to be a member of this church. My, there'd be an exodus out of the churches. Our preacher's gone nuts, they'd say. They'd accuse him of being a lunatic. But you know, John the Baptist's message was repentance. Jesus' first message was repentance. Peter's first message on Pentecost was repentance. Friend, you take repentance out of New Testament Christianity, you don't have anything. It's imperative that every sinner repent of his sins. What does that mean? That means he acknowledges it, he turns his mind away from it and changes his life and goes about the opposite direction. It's admitting it and quitting it is what repentance means. Amen. Amen. But John the Baptist was bold. Looked at old Herod. Old, ruthless, mean Herod and said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. Whoa. Here was a man sent from God. 
Here was a man who blindly told the people their sin and told them there's one that's coming after me who can do far more for you than just baptize you with the water of repentance. John the Baptist's ministry was tremendous. It was greatly blessed. It was growing. It was really blossoming. Everyone was flocking to John. They were asking, are you the Messiah? No, sir, I'm not. But there's one that standeth among you right now that you know not of. He's here, but you don't recognize him yet. You know, I don't know if many of them even did ever recognize him. But he was there. His message of repentance, not just lip service, not just joining the church, not just going down and being baptized, but actually a change of heart and a change of life that comes around to God's way of doing things. Oh, I'm so glad, friend, that you can do God's will from the heart. I'm glad that you can love this way uh, that God has prescribed us to live. It doesn't seem to be a bondage this morning. His commandments are not grievous today, but it's a good way, Brother Newton. It's a wonderful way. It's a joyous way. It is a blessed way. It is a hallowed way this morning. And John the Baptist said, this is what you need to do. You need to change the way you're living and get to God. Lord, you know, there's a lot of folks that need that message today. Bring therefore fruits, meat for repentance, not just the commoners. He told the church world they need to repent. He told Herod he needed to repent. He was rebuked. I tell you, he spared none <laughs> because he was a man sent from God. He was God's man for the hour. He preached repentance. He preached faith. You say, where does he find that at? John 3, 36. John records some things about John the Baptist that's very critical. And these are the words of John the Baptist preaching. He said, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. He said, you're going to have to put your faith in the one that God sent the one that God has ordained to be the Messiah and the Savior of the world, you're going to have to put your faith in him. Praise God. It's still the same message, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Repent and faith. That's the two conditions of salvation today. You must turn from your sin under old-fashioned conviction, and you must put your entire trust in the merits of Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. And when those two come together, God will seal it and do the work in your heart. Make you a new creature. All things will pass away. Behold, all things will then become new and you become a child of God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And John the Baptist had good doctrinal preaching here. He said he preached on repentance. He preached on faith. He preached on baptism. Not for the salvation of their souls or to wash away their sin, but as a testimony to the world, an open sign of what God had indeed done for them. He preached on holiness. He said he did. Oh yeah, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but there cometh after me one that is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's holiness. That's sanctification. That's God's second work for the believers that he wants to purify our hearts by faith and give us the blessed comforter to abide with us forever. What a glorious doctrine this morning. But what a more glorious experience to know that your sins are blotted out. You repented and the blood of Jesus washed you clean and then the Holy Ghost purges out the old nature and fills you with God and the Holy Spirit. What a glorious experience this morning. What a glorious experience. And John was preaching repentance. He was preaching baptism. He was preaching faith. He was preaching holiness. And he even preached eternal realities. So what's an eternal reality? Heaven and hell. Those are eternal realities. You can push it out of your mind if you want to, but they are eternal realities. Listen to what he said. Matthew 3.12 Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. He will gather his wheat into the garner. The wheat is the good stuff. The grain is what is important. And God is going to gather that into his garner, into his bin. All right? But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable 
Fire, fire that never goes out, friend. Fire that is never extinguished. God has eternal realities. And a good message has faith and repentance and holiness and baptism and eternal realities. He preached on all the cardinal truths, brother. He brought it all in in a small, short message. But I want to tell you it was real. He said, you better pay attention. He's got his fan in his hand. He's going to thoroughly sweep the floor. And you're going to be in one bin or the other. You're going to be gathered with the wheat and be safe in the place of God. Or you're going to be gathered with the chaff and you're thrown in the fire. Friend, let's wake up this morning. This is a divine, eternal reality. And it happens sometimes in a moment. It happens before people get ready for it to happen. Death is sudden sometimes. And as the tree falleth, so shall it lie. How we leave this world is how we will enter eternity. If we leave this world in victory, we leave this world with the blood applied, with the word of God and, and the will of God in our hearts to do the will of God, friend, we'll have an eternity rejoicing. But if we leave this world as a Christ rejecter and turn aside the message of life and hope, we have nothing good to look forward to. John said in Luke chapter 3 verse 9, he said, he, excuse me, the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is cast, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Eternal realities. What kind of fruit are we bringing forth this morning? Think about it. These messages and John's message is just as relevant today as it was when he issued it. Just as relevant. And it's up to us this morning to think about eternal realities. I'm not going to be here forever. Let that dawn on us. We're not going to be here forever. But we will live on forever. There was a time you did not exist, but there never will be a time from now throughout the rest of eternity that you will cease to exist. You will be somewhere forever, friend. And it depends on what you do with Jesus as to where that somewhere is going to be. That's serious stuff. That's what John the Baptist was preaching. He was telling them, you need to wake up. You need to stir yourself. There's one that's coming that's going to pay the price for our sins. There's one that's coming that's going to fulfill the prophecies of the Messiah. And you need to get ready for his coming. Get ready. Get the sin out of your life. Turn away from it. Begin to do what you know to do is right. Wow, what a message. What a message. I'll say, well, what was the measurement of his life? Well, if we measured it in the length of his ministry, we'd say it wasn't very much. I can't give you an exact time, but I believe probably the ministry of John the Baptist was measured in months. He was six months older than Jesus. If he stepped on the scene at 30, which is what Jesus did, which was considered a man under that economy. You became a man at 30. If John the Baptist stepped on the scene at 30, he had six months before Jesus turned 30 and started his ministry. And one of the first things we read, one of the first things we read that Jesus did early on in the Gospels is that he went out to John and was baptized of John in the River Jordan. Do you remember reading that early on in the Gospels? And after Jesus was baptized with the Spirit there by the River Jordan as the Spirit descended like a dove upon Jesus. And Jesus began his active preaching ministry. John's disciples began to migrate over to Jesus. People began to ask John, said, this one that you recognized out by the River Jordan, said, he's... He's climbing the ladder of success here in the ministerial realm. And your, your crowd's diminishing. John said, he must increase. I must decrease. And it wasn't long till we read that John's in prison. It's not long till we read that John's out of the ministry. He's in jail. He's no longer preaching and baptizing by the River Jordan. Can you see that his ministry probably only lasted less than a year? Maybe a year, maybe. 
That's not a very long ministry, is it? If we measured the man by the length of his ministry, we would say, I'm not so sure he did very well. He wasn't in it very long. If we would measure his ministry by the way he died, it's a my. That's not a very nice way for a man sent from God to die. He was condemned in jail and then his head taken off at the whim of a woman. What kind of what kind of legacy is that for this great prophet of the Lord? Friend, we don't look at things like God looks at things. And we don't gauge success like God gauges success. God's looking for faithfulness. God's looking for faithfulness. We may not have the biggest church. We may not be the greatest evangelist. We may not be the most renowned singers. God's looking for faithfulness. Don't ever forget that. His popularity was replaced by Jesus. Faced with imprisonment by rebuking a king. Being faithful to tell the man the truth cost him jail time. And we think that would be awful if we're counted worthy to be spent or to spend time in jail. Would we count that as an honor this morning? Would we count that as a, a privilege of serving the Lord that we've been counted worthy to stand strong enough and faithful enough that they've actually put us in jail. John the Baptist was put in jail and then later beheaded. Wow, preacher. What, what do you think Jesus thought about John the Baptist? Let me read it to you. It's found in Matthew 11, 7 through 11. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went you out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind, tossed to and fro? Do you see something that was vacillating? Do you see something that, you know, was once, depending on which way the winds were blowing, he, his message fit that crowd? Jesus said, What did you see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Wow. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Jesus said, Yea, I say unto you, then more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily, and when Jesus wanted to make a point, he used the word verily. That's an emphatic, listen to me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. Verily, I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now that's the commendation from the Lord. A man sent from God. A man with a message. A man with a ministry. A man who measured above all the other. Can you imagine the Lord promoting any prophet above Elijah? <laughs> Can you imagine any Israelite believing that any prophet could be greater than Elisha? I mean, these two great prophets, many, many miracles, raising people from the dead, mighty miracles. And you know, the Bible says something else about John. John did no miracle. He wasn't out there showing the crowd the power of God through miracles. The Bible clearly says that John did no miracles. But John had a message. He had a ministry. He had a calling. And he was sent from God to tell the people and show them their sin and get them to turn from that sin so that the Messiah could get them where they needed to be, saved and into the kingdom of God. What a privilege this morning. You know, during that 400 years of darkness, during that 400 years where there was no prophetical voice, during that time Israel had got in deplorable condition, but aren't you glad God still had a, a group? You stop and think about the characters around the Christmas story. 
Joseph and Mary, godly people. Zechariah and Elizabeth, godly people. Anna and Simeon, godly people. John the Baptist, the greatest prophet. The greatest prophet. Of those born of women, and all the other prophets were born of women, <laughs> there's not risen a greater than John the Baptist. What made him great? His faithfulness. His faithfulness to do what God had ordained him to do. Even when it meant that his popularity was waning. Even when it meant he had the chance to say, you know, I mean, people were looking at him, are you the Messiah? What a temptation maybe for carnal people <laughs> to take that time. Oh, well, you know, man, I can, I can run this country if I let them believe I'm the Messiah. If he was ever tempted that way, he didn't yield. No, I'm not the Messiah. But he's in your midst. He's among you. You don't know him, but he's among you. And one, when he reveals himself, he's going to do greater things than I'm doing. I must decrease, and he must increase. Great is the faithfulness and humility and simplicity and goodness of this man. But his message, his message, repent, repent, turn from your sin, believe the Christ that's coming to be the Savior of the world. Put your faith in him. Be baptized according to the commandment of Scripture. Go on and let him fill you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Because you're going to heaven. Or you're going to hell, one or the other. As we stand this morning, this message still rings true today, friend. If there's anyone here this morning that would like to know the Messiah, like to meet the Christ, like to have your sins forgiven, like to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, the altar is open. God is so good to send a message, to send a messenger, to get us ready for those eternal realities. God is so good. He could have left them in the dark. But he sent a messenger. He gave them a message of divine truth. Anyone here with a burden or need on your heart this morning?